Greetings! Welcome to today's tutorial. We are going to be talking about skin conditions. And with the skin, we are breaking it up into two parts. This first part is about the dermis, which is the deeper layer of our skin. I will save the epidermis for another presentation. I'm Dr. Melissa, by the way. It's great to meet you and introduce you to the brilliance that is the five biological laws of German New Medicine. This presentation is based on information published on www.learninggnm.com. We thank the author, Carolyn Markelin, PhD, for her consent to use the GNM material, including the subject-related diagrams, for the production of this video. This information is for educational purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional medical advice. So let's talk about the corium skin or the dermis. So this is the deep underneath layer of the skin and it is an old mesodermal derived tissue and its function is protection. And I think that the, the function of the um, this area of the body is extremely interesting and the point that it evolved in human history was a point after life moved on land. So after organisms were primarily water dwelling and moved onto the land. And so as you move on to land, there are a new set of challenges that you are up against. And one of them is the notion or the concept or the ability to have something on your skin that is unwanted. So the concept of feeling soiled or dirty or having some type of attack on this part of your skin. And that is what we will be looking at as far as the conflict associated with this area of the body is attack and soiling conflicts. Now this part of the skin, the dermis, is composed of melanocytes. And so melanocytes are where we derive the color, the tone of our skin from the melanin it creates. And the interesting thing about melanocytes is that they, when you look at just a, a cross section of the epidermis, the melanocytes seem to be a part of the epidermis. But embryologically, they derive from something called neural crest cells, and then they migrated into the epidermis. And so they do not follow the same epidermal uh, ectoderm pattern. They are controlled from the old mesoderm, which is um, controlled from the cerebellum. So that's just a little bit of um, interesting facts for people that are uh, fascinated by embryology and are curious about why I'm including melanocytes in the dermis. Um, the dermis also includes sebaceous and sweat glands. So like I mentioned, the this area is controlled from the cerebellar mesoderm. And so there is a control center, as you can see at the image on the left, if you look at those target rings, the black and white target rings, that is the control region in the brainstem that controls um, the this area of the body, which means that when there is a DHS, when there is a conflict, and you have a CT scan of the brain, this is where you will see that DHS, that conflict activity in one of these two particular areas. Now there is a crossover correlation in the cerebellum, which means that the right half of the body is controlled from the left half of the brain, which means that there is a crossover correlation with the individual. So if you are a right-handed person, and you are experiencing your conflict and it has to do with your mother or your child, the manifestation of the issue with the corium skin will show up on the left side because that's your mother-child side versus if it was a partner or another person, it would be on your right side. Now the conflict shock, and now we all know in German New Medicine that this is the moment. This is the Durkheimer syndrome. This is the event that initiates the body's need to protect itself, which sets off the biological special program. And so for the corium skin, remember it developed in a condition where it needed to protect us. And so it responds to an attack conflict. So this could be a, an actual attack. So, you know, stepping on a nail, a car accident, some type of sports or physical fighting injury, somebody slapping you in the face. So something actually physically attacking you. But then because we are conceptual beings, because we have this capacity, we have this advanced mind, we can perceive something as an attack that is not in fact an actual attack where someone is trying to hurt us. 
It could be some type of medical procedure that you are perceiving as an attack, or at least your the ancient part of your body, the ancient part of you is perceiving this as an attack, a biopsy, a mastectomy, amputation, a vaccination, a blood draw, also feeling attacked by the sun. We will talk specifically about melanoma and about the, you know, the fear of skin cancer as due to the sun as being a perception issue. Now you could also have an emotional attack. So you're feeling attacked even though there's no physical attack. It could be abuse, ongoing abuse, fight, criticism, an insult, a threat, uh, discrimination, defamation, verbal attacks, or aggressive words. And all of this depends on the individual, on their sensitivities, on their experiences, on what they've had happen to them, on how sensitized they are to certain things, is how they will perceive this attack conflict. Now there's another element to this. So like I mentioned, when you, when we were in the water, when we were water dwelling creatures, you were like, it's like you're being in the bath all the time. You don't feel the need to wash yourself when you're constantly covered in water. But now you've got the skin that can have something on it that you consider dirty or disgusting. And so this feeling of un, um, being unclean or being soiled can also initiate the conflict activity for the corium or the dermis skin. So it could be actual dirt. It could be you, you've got something on you, something disgusting on you, some kind of bodily fluid, something that you perceive as uh, smelly or stinky. It could be an issue of incontinence some type of discharge on your skin, also feeling soiled due to an acne outbreak. Now, there is also the figurative soiling. Now, this is like something dirty happens to you. Sexual abuse, coming into contact with something unclean. This is very interesting as um, when it comes to epidemics. So if you are afraid of disease, you're afraid of infection, you're afraid of someone coughing, you're afraid of someone sneezing near you, and you have this fear, you could have a feeling soiled conflict just as a result of coming into contact with the person. Not because there was a transfer of a pathogen, but because you perceived a soiling event by being near this person. Also, uh, dirty words, someone gossiping about you, some type of food that you may have consumed that you didn't realize, and, and you, then you, you realize it and you feel like, oh, this was something I should not have eaten. This is unhealthy. You could feel soiled by that. Feeling disfigured. Being embarrassed about your appearance or feeling ugly um, has a lot to do with the development of teenage acne. Also, feeling defiled. So you can see the many, many, many different ways there are to perceive our situations where someone might have this particular conflict. So the first biological law states that at the moment of a conflict, so the moment that your psyche perceives that there is an attack or a feeling soiled conflict, that is immediately registered in the cerebellum at the area that we I showed you before. And immediately the program is set off, the button is, is pushed, the biological special program of the dermis begins, which is proliferation. It's a protective shield. It's a barrier. It is adding additional cells for your protection against this attack, against this soiling that you have perceived. Now, the second biological law, I want to des describe an overview of what basically is happening when you have this type of conflict. Remember, with the second biological law, there is two, a two-phase pattern to all biological special programs. So normally, our bodies shift from sympathetic active, sympathetic otonia during the day, higher heart rate, and then in the evening, everything shifts to parasympathetic rest digest dominance. So that's the normal day-night rhythm. The moment that you have a conflict, the moment of the DHS, the moment of this feeling soiled or feeling attacked conflict, that day-night rhythm, it breaks and you go into prolonged sympathetic activity. And so this is where your tissue is being recruited to help you. In some way, your body is activating itself to help you to overcome whatever this conflict may be until you get to the resolution point. So let's look at what's happening dur during the conflict active phase. So as soon as it happens, there is a strengthening and a thickening of the skin area 
for defense and for protection from attack or defilement. So it's putting a barrier, it's adding cells, it's making you more protected against whatever this thing you are perceiving. Um, and so at the psyche level, you're thinking about it, you're really upset about it, you know, and you're, you're just awake and you're just worried and mulling over it. And so the, depending on the type of circumstance, this could be finish right away. You, you know, if it was a feeling soiled and it was because you got something gross on your hands, it could be as simple as going to wash your hands that causes the conflict resolution. But if it's something that's more ongoing or if it's more conceptual or if it has to do with abuse and something that's ongoing, that's not something that's easy to just wash your hands of. And so as long as you are conflict active, as long as you are in that state of being upset, there's going to be tissue recruited. There's going to be a growing of some type of um, the, the corium skin. So there's going to be this dermal proliferation. The area is going to depend on where you perceived it or where the attack was felt. It could be, you know, if it's against your face, against your back. It's all about your perception about where the particular outbreak of whatever it is is going to manifest. But the goal is conflict resolution. We want to get to the point where we feel safe where we feel relieved, where we no longer are feeling attacked or feeling soiled. So again, like I said, it could be as simple as a shower of washing to resolve it, which means that there's not going to be much of a uh, tissue that was recruited. So you may not, these things are happening to us all of the time. We have little conflicts, little little soiling conflicts, little attack conflicts, you, you know, prick your finger, things like that, where you're not experiencing a huge upheaval and a lot of tissues is going to be changed but when you have situations that are ongoing or were extremely intense this is where we will see little growths pop up maybe you know it's something like a melanoma a mole pops up um, so we want to resolve as quickly as possible that's the goal with all of these conflicts that be we become aware of and we now know oh wow every time that I'm really upset about something it's not just me and my head in a jar that's separate from my body having this issue your body is an is a part of you and everything that you experience on a psychological emotional level is being experienced by your tissues and your body's not just going to sit there while you are endangered it's not just it's it helps you. It recruits tissues to help resolution of situations in the way that it knows how to do. Your body is ancient. These programs developed at a period of time where we didn't have the ability to think about it. It was respond, respond, respond. Do what we need to do to, to get out of the situation, to prolong our life, to protect us. And so that's why it seems so rudimentary that the body would do this. Almost silly to us with our complex minds and our ability to think, oh, well, you know, this this growth isn't going to protect me from, from anything. But your body is old, it's ancient, and it does things differently because of the time when it developed. So we want to resolve with a natural resolution, perhaps emotional release or forgiveness, a new perspective, new understanding, shifting priorities, seeing the bigger picture. So once that happens, once we resolve the conflict, once we're no longer feeling attacked, we go into phase A of healing, which is we're moving into that parasympathetic dominance. And so the area is going to be warm. There's pain there because there's swelling, because all healing happens in a fluid environment. And there's, you know, tissue changes, there's exudate, there's, you know, discharge and pus. And what's happening is there is fungi and mycobacteria at work. And they, their job is to decompose the additional proliferation of the dermal cells. They break it down, the cells that were built up during conflict activity, because they are no longer necessary for your function. And so this is just the, the way that the body developed. And it evolved alongside with fungus and alongside all sorts of different bacteria and so we work in harmony with one another now if your bacteria are gone due to um, antibiotic use the the growth will then encapsulate because it doesn't have the necessary components to break it down so at the psyche level you are relieved you know you're over whatever the situation is there's an impact in the brain remember in the cerebellum where the impact was there is now fluid in that region as well and there is construction at the site at the organ level and the intensity yes it does depend on the intensity of the conflict and so if it was a really upsetting event that took place you can you know and it was extremely intense on that scale 
you're going to have more tissue impact than if it was, you know, something that was brief and, and didn't last for very long. The epileptoid crisis. So this is the height of the healing phase. This is when the maximum am amount of fluid has filled the area and now the body needs a sympathetic uh, stress push to squeeze out the edema and to get things moving back um, to a normal day-night rhythm. And so this is where you'll have itching, tingling, burning, some type of sensation um, or muscle spasm at the area. In the case of shingles, there's a very sharp stinging pain when you are in the healing phase. And so we're pushing out the edema and we are getting the body to a normalized state. The second phase of healing is scarification. So there's fibroblasts and a new collagen being made and we're just trying to build back up and restore the area to a pre-conflict status or as close as we can get to that. Um, and so that is the entire program of the two phases of a conflict regarding the corium skin. Now I want to address some individual um, issues that come up with the corium skin. For example, a melanoma. So a melanoma is a proliferation of the melanocytes, which are the melanin producing cells within the skin. And so you can see all the examples here of these different moles and how they're different colors. And we know that melanin, so the melanin in the skin, is protective. And so people that are exposed to lots and lots of sunshine have a lot more melanin in their skin for that protective, absorptive capacity of the UV rays that the dark melanin has. So we all have these cells in us. It's just as far as the expression, depending on where your heritage, where your ancestors lived, will depend on how much melanin you have in your skin at a given time. But we all have these uh, melanocytes, which have the capacity to produce this melanin in protection. And so you can have a melanoma where these color producing cells in the body are proliferating, again, for protection. A lot of people think that it's the sun that causes skin cancer. It's the sun that will cause a melanoma. The interesting thing about that is that lesions of melanoma are typically found in areas that aren't exposed to the sun. So like underneath bra straps and underneath, you know, underwear lines and um, places that normally aren't even exposed to the sun. You'd think it would be very common on the arms, but mostly they are hidden. Also, many people report that they have moles like this that pop up. They have these, you know, these dark pigmented areas and then they'll disappear and they just go away completely. And how do you explain that? If it's just a random thing, it just does it randomly come, randomly go. Is it cancer? Is it not? Um, did the sun cause it? Why is it there? Because there are people that spend a lot of time in the sun and never get skin cancer. They never get a melanoma. And then there are people that literally avoid the sun, they wear sunblock all the time, yet still will get something like a melanoma. And so the problem is we're, we're looking at it in the wrong way from the mainstream perspective. It is because of a conflict shock. It is an attack conflict or a feeling soiled conflict. Now, a person can indeed have an attack conflict because of the sun, you know, because we have this concept that the sun is dangerous, that the sun causes cancer. If you feel, oh my goodness, I spent way too much time outside, or if someone starts mentioning, mentioning it to you and you get worried, that can definitely induce an attack conflict, which would uh, pro proliferate the melanocytes and cause the problem that you were worried about and scared about. So remember, during conflict activity, the, um, the melanocytes are uh, proliferating for protection. It's this archaic form of defense. It's these little shields that our body is making to protect us. So again, it is rudimentary, it is archaic, but it formed at a time when this was a good defense for the body. So during the healing phase is where you experience these changes to the normal character of the of the mole or of the the site of this lesion. And so this is something that people tell you to watch out for. So is this mole is it changing shape? You know, is it uh, bleeding? Are there various colors? Is there any oozing? Any discharge? And those are typically the warning signs for someone that their mole has turned cancerous. And what is 
happening is that the body is starting to break it down. And so if it's swollen, if it's like getting spongy, if it's changing in that way, it's the bacteria that are at work. The program is shifted from activ- activity of conflict where we're adding cells and now the body is starting to break it down. Now, I'm not saying to not go get your moles checked out by all means. This is something that, you know, you have to make the decision of what you want to do. And most people will err on the set of caution of going to get it checked out. But doing that with the knowledge that your body has perceived an attack, your body has perceived a conflict, can you identify it? Can you say, hmm, you know what, I think I do know why this is here. I'm still going to go get this checked out anyways. And for some people, the path of least resistance may be actually having the mole removed because they're scared just the presence of it is causing an attack or a, a fear or a death fright conflict. And so sometimes having it removed um, maybe the best route. I'm not telling you to, to to get it checked out, to not get it checked out, to have it removed, to not have it removed. This isn't any kind of medical advice. This is just a paradigm. This is a philosophy. This is a way of understanding why it's there in the first place. And by having that understanding and by having a different perspective, you're able to make a truly informed and educated decision and not a decision out of fear. That is my main thing I like to teach people is, you know, you, I'm not telling you to listen to, to me and in my advice, I'm saying to make whatever decision you make from a place of confidence and not a place of fear, because it's truly the fear, the panic, the scare that is the driver of all of this to begin with. It was the fear, it was the attack conflict, the the feeling soil conflict that initiated the tissue changes. Therefore, we want to, you know, we want to resolve the conflict, whatever it is, and we want to feel empowered and at ease with whatever we decide to do. And so that is my advice when it comes to, you know, what to do about about moles and these spots that you see. You know, look at it through this new lens. See how you feel about it. See if it resonates. See if you can determine or pinpoint, ah, oh, you know what, this does make sense to me and then you decide what you want to do and if there's no wrong decision if it feels good to you if you're at ease about it that is the best path for you so let's talk about shingles this is another really really interesting topic because it's another one of those misconceptions misunderstood we we kind of think of it as grown-up chicken pox like oh it's this herpes zoster virus and you know it it presents completely differently and it has a completely different manner of um, interacting. You know, it's, it's, you know, chicken pox are typically all over the body. Shingles follow this interesting dermatomal pattern and they're typically only on one side of the body, but we're telling you it's the same disease. Um, so shingles themselves, they're amelanotic melanomas and so they're non-pigmented. And so instead of being the pigment cells that are proliferating, these are ones that uh, do not have that dark pigment. They're non-pigmented. And so Um, This, again, it's initiated by a feeling of being attacked or feeling soiled. And there is that handedness correlation. And so the the shingles, they do, they they break out in people that have had a, um, some type of issue. It could be with a partner. And so the shingles will um, follow that right hand, left hand pattern. Chicken pox in, involves the epidermal layer, so that upper layer of the skin, and it's uh, controlled from the cerebral cortex. So Dr. Hammer did so many studies and looked at different people that had shingles, that had chicken pox, and he found every time there was a correlation with the uh, epidermis in the chicken pox is controlled from the cerebral cortex. So that's where the DHS will be as seen on CT scan. And the shingles involves the brainstem. And so that's where the DHS will be. So they're two separate types of problems and they actually have different um, conflict shocks. So chicken pox and the issue with the epidermis is a separation conflict, whereas the dermis, like we've been talking about, is an attack or a feeling soil conflict. Um, So shingles can also have an epidermal component if there is a concurrent separation conflict. And so, you you know, we are extremely complex beings. So you could also, you could, you know, feel attacked, you know, if someone did something to you and at the same time you feel, oh my goodness, they, you know, I feel soiled, I feel attacked, but I also know now I'm going to be separated from this person. Um, You could have a separation conflict or you want to be separated from them, which will affect the epidermis. Now, all of these things, all of these situations, all of these um, interactions that we have with other people and the way that we um, represent it to ourselves, 
there's so many different things that be, can be going on at the same time, so many different interpretations. And so when you are aware of the model of GNM, when you know the five biological laws and when you get tuned in to how you are perceiving things, it changes so much about how you interpret the world and then definitely how you interpret these symptoms. So let's talk about the sebaceous glands. So those are the oil secreting um, glands deep in the skin to lubricate our skin. And so acne, this was, I was so excited to learn about this um, when I first um, got into this stuff because I had acne so frequently when I was a teenager and then throughout my 20s and then every so often I'd still get these breakouts and it just is the most frustrating thing when you think that it's caused from diet and you think that it's caused from, you know, uh, bacteria on your skin and you just try to wash all the bacteria off, you try to eat really good and somehow you're still getting these, um, these breakouts because breakouts are feeling soiled or attack conflicts. Very common in teens. Um, and a lot of times it gets initiated from, you know, here you are, you are, you begin to be, when you're a kid, you don't really care too much about how you look. But when you're a teenager and you go to high school and you get really concerned about your appearance and, you know, feeling ugly, feeling judged, you know, people saying things to you, confrontations with parents, feeling bullied. Um, and so you have these conflicts that start to come up in your life. Life gets more complicated. And so you have an initial breakout. And then the breakout itself um, can cause um, an ongoing issue of feeling soiled. And so it gets bumpy kind of during the conflict. And then when you go into healing phase, that's when the actual breakout is there. That's when there's pus. That's when it's red. That's when you feel like the problem is when the zit is there, but that's not when the problem is. That's when it's already healed. We also have these sebaceous cysts and um, trichelemal cysts, which can be on these hair follicles, a lump beneath the skin that forms. It's actually interesting. I have one on the very top of my head and I've determined that it had to have come from an attack conflict because I started learning to do um, inversions and then, you know, learning to do handstands, you start with a headstand because I know this bump was not here before, but as I have been doing these headstands, I think the top of my, my head got an attack conflict and formed um, one of these hair follicle cysts, which I think is really interesting. So this is that acne feedback loop. And so this is how a person can stay in um, consistent breakouts for years at a time. So it starts from feeling attacked or feeling soiled in any of the various ways we discussed. Um, then you have the dermal cell proliferation, and then you resolve the conflict, but then you have the breakout. But the breakout itself serves as additional conflict. So every time it's there, you're hating it, you're thinking it's ugly, you're feeling soiled, you try to wash your face, and you just feel dirty because your skin is broken out. And that causes an attack or feeling soil conflict where you feel it all over again. And so you stay in this loop until you just say, I remember being a teenager and like I'd get, you know, try to clear up the skin and clear and it, and then I just say, forget it, whatever. I don't even care. And you stop caring and then the, the skin clears up because you've decided just to kind of like let it, let it go. Um, and so that's the big part with this, um, this loop is you just have to break it at some point, realize your body is in healing, realize it's doing something, and resolve that conflict. So candidiasis of the skin. So this is commonly called ringworm, which is not a worm at all. It's, they, you know, they call it a, a fungus of the skin, but they call it ringworm, so it's kind of confusing for people. Um, so this occurs when fungus aids in the healing phase because, again, fungus is this ancient ancient wonderful part of ecology and it helps to break things down like you know in the woods it breaks down wood and so it helps to break down when you have certain issues in your skin and so this can show up in the genital area it can show up in the feet um, you know if you're sweaty and you're wearing you know tight uh, synthetic exercise clothes um, even you know some type of unclean sex practices, something that makes you um, feel dirty, actually dirty or perceived to be dirty. Um, sick or elderly people feeling soiled in diapers can commonly have candida, uh, candidiasis of the skin in that area. Uh, tinea versicolor. So this is where people, uh, you can see the image there, like have blotches of their skin that, um, you know, are don't have their pigment anymore. And so during the um, conflict active phase, there's hyperpigmentation because remember there's thickening of the skin and then um, the uh, 
there's breakdown during the healing phase, which is hypopigmentation. And if a person is in conflict activity ongoing on and off and on and off and you're conflict and then you're healing and then you're conflict and you're healing, um, the lasting fungal activity, so the fungus has been active in that region trying to break down the proliferation of the, the uh, tissue cells that it um, can eat away at the pigment permanently so you can have those patches due to a hanging healing. If it's a one-off thing, if it just happens once, it's unlikely to, to stay um, with the, the color changes that way. But when you have ongoing conflicts, it can make permanent tissue changes. Also nail fungus. And so if you, you know, come into some in contact with something you think is unclean or disgusting, the dermis cells underneath the, the nail bed can have that same kind of buildup. Remember, it's protecting you. And then the, um, the fungus in that region helps to break it down. Sweat glands are another um, member, uh, component of the corium skin. And so they regulate body temperature, eliminate metabolic waste. And so a, an attack or feeling soil conflict can cause actual proliferation of the sweat glands themselves, causing hyperhidrosis, which is excessive sweating. It could be just generalized all over sweating, or it could be very specific to the groin or to the underarm. Um, and so during the healing phase, there's intense odor due to the fungi breakdown that's breaking down the um, proliferation that was present in the sweat gland um, or the bacteria. And so these are people, this is you know, for people that they create these heavy duty deodorants because you happen to have like a sweating problem that they call some kind of you know, genetic sweating problem, but it's an attack conflict. And, and then uh, tinea pedis, which is considered a fungal infection of the feet sweat glands. This one's so interesting because we say, oh, you know, the uh, it's an infection that brews in the wet shoes of people. And the thing is, is it has to do with the person's perception of my, oh, my foot is in this like sweaty shoe or in these gross socks that I've been wearing for too long um, or your parent told you to really you know make sure you don't step on things when you're out in public or using public showers um, and you didn't bring your flip-flops and you end up stepping on the dirty floor and you have this kind of perception that this is dirty I shouldn't step on this I'm stepping in this filth and um, and so the body does d proliferation in the feet sweat glands and then there's breakdown of the dermal cells that were proliferated and that's what causes the rash. Boils and so this is another thing that can affect the deep layer of the dermis also called a furuncle or carbuncle um, nodule filled with pus from bacterial activity in the corium skin during the healing phase. Um, uh, boils can also form in connective tissue due to a self-devaluation conflict um, but you can see this like image of this one here, um, boils on the back of the neck or on their uh, a person's back can be um, as a result of someone perceiving somebody stabbed them in the back or said terrible things about them um, behind their back. And that's how their body manifests um, that protective capacity. Now, this one's really interesting, the pilonidal cyst that can form on the tailbone near the buttock cleft due to an attack conflict. And so these pilonidal cysts were very common um, post-World War II, and they called it the Jeep Rider's Disease because these Jeeps uh, were very, very bumpy. And so this constant kind of attack that the um, individuals were perceiving or that their body perceived an attack at the side of the tailbone would cause um, this very interesting type of cyst. Uh, so the third biological law, um, we've seen that displayed all throughout talking about the dermis. So you can see that the, the dermis, if you look um, where it says cerebellum, so the cerebellum is that old mesodermal tissue. And so the program during conflict activity is cell proliferation. After conflict is over, there is cell removal with fungi and bacteria. So every single disease, disorder, dysfunction that we call it, it was actually a special biological program. They all follow this model. There is no randomness. There's no, you know, it's a very systematic way of understanding what is going on in the body. The fourth biological law, we saw that at play with the uh, candida. We saw it with, you know, these different fungus and bacteria that break down the additional cells that were built up during conflict activity. Um, if they are not present, the tumors will encapsulate. The fifth biological law, remember, disease is not an error. Your body is not making a mistake. 
this is for your benefit is the reason that these processes have evolved. And um, yeah, it's something to be praised and to say, wow, my body is doing something great right now. And, you know, there are times for medical intervention. And that's why it will be great when medicine recognizes this model and understands the five biological laws so that when necessary, the intervention is exactly appropriate. It's not going beyond what is necessary just for the survival of the person because due to fear, due to misunderstanding, due to not being, you know, not realizing that bacteria are our friends and fungus helps us and no, knowing how the psyche plays this role in initiating all of these things, we take really drastic measures today in our modern approach. It's like absolute, you know, biological warfare it seems like when really we just need to be supporting this system that's already brilliant it already knows exactly what it's doing and everything is going according to a plan it's just man uh, you know egoic man we don't know the plan we we haven't been aware of it but dr hammer figured it out he mapped it out and i'm sure there's so much more to discover um, but nobody is doing that discovering because we're stuck in an old model and there's so much built up in that model that it's hard to get people to see um, that there's another perception, there's another way of viewing what's going on, which is my passion, which is why I do what I do, which is why I make these videos, because there's just so much wisdom within our bodies and um, they are to be understood, not to be overridden, not to be... Um, tossed aside as as faulty and erroneous you know we need to learn from our bodies and that's what i'm going to continue to do in teaching you these workshops and lessons um, if you want to contact me feel free to send me an email dr melissa cell at gmail.com i have a self-healing support group where i can help you um, connect with these principles um, help to overcome your conflicts figure out what is necessary for you to take the steps in healing that you want to take so please subscribe to my channel please share my videos i would like to reach as many people as possible with this comforting wonderful knowledge of the wisdom of our bodies. So thank you again, and I will see you again soon.